Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa kafaa wa salamun ala ibadihi ladhina aslafa amma ba'd. So, all of us here locally in Chicago, we are um, fully aware of who Shaykh Hussein Abdul Sadar is. But we have, mashallah, a lot of uh, guests from out of state as well. So, alhamdulillah, um, this is just a summary of, the, of, of his uh, biography. I cannot go over all the entire bio, uh, but alhamdulillah, he was born here in Chicago. And Shaykh Hussein, after completing his primary education, then he joined the University of Chicago, alhamdulillah. And while he was studying in the university, he began his study of the sacred knowledge, including Nahu uh, Sarf, Fiqh, Usul Fiqh, under Ulama. And he also started his training in, in Islamic spirituality. Alhamdulillah. I may, may have mentioned to some of the students before, but I'm not sure if I mentioned publicly one example of this. I, I was with him in a wedding uh, with Mona Shuaib, his brother. So we were sitting on the table. The groom was the brother of Molana, and while we were waiting for the food to be served, Molana said, Oh, Sheikh Hussein, did you bring your quduri? That was before he was Sheikh Dr. Hussein. <laughs> so he said, Yeah, I was sitting on the same table. Then he pulled out his quduri and then they started going over quduri lesson uh, while uh, the food was getting ready to be served. Alhamdulillah. There are so many different examples that I have seen of this uh, in person. Alhamdulillah. Um, then after that, he, he took a break from the University of Chicago and he went to Syria and Pakistan. He studied uh, Dars al Nizami, the traditional curriculum, for a number of years. And he continued studying Islamic spirituality as well. And he received his authorizations in, in 2001. Alhamdulillah. So the past um, 21 years, he is practicing uh, tasawwuf and ilm and teaching people, guiding people. He is currently an associate professor of pathology at the University of Chicago's School of Medicine and is a practicing surgical pathologist at the University of Chicago Medical Center. And he's most widely known for his contributions to medical education. So we know him from his, the Tuskegee perspective and all of his students um, back from the days of I ICC in the basement where they had the phenomenal etikaf sessions. But now, alhamdulillah, in the beautiful Sacred Learning Center which is a beautiful masjid and place of Tazkiyah. Um, alhamdulillah that we all go and our students go and we encourage everyone to go and attend the programs, the mehfil, and get spiritually recharged. But outside of this, outside of our Muslim circles, in the medical schools, in the students of medicine throughout America, throughout the world, in fact, his textbook on the fundamentals of pathology is one of the most popular medical textbooks. And his website is as well used by medical students, most medical students across the world. So subhanAllah, this reminds me of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu Allah kataba alaykum al-ihsana fi kulli shay. Allah Ta'ala wants us, whatever we do, to do it with perfection. Um, Shaykh Hussain, he resides in Chicago with his wife and his four children. And mashallah, he teaches and lectures across the United States on various subjects of Islamic knowledge, including purification of the soul. So tonight's topic is um, regarding sleep, the sunnah and the science. So SubhanAllah is most qualified as he has studied sharia as well as medicine. So we will learn the sunnah and the science of sleep. And we do not want to fall asleep here. We're not going to make, there's no practically, we don't, we don't want to have a practical session. We're going to learn uh, the theory of it, go home and practice. Uh, sleep is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though we mistakenly sometimes view it as an unproductive waste of time. Join us to learn the importance of sleep spiritually, physically, psychologically, and to gain 10 practical steps ten, from the Quran and the Sunnah that we can implement to live happier, more healthy lives. Jazakumullah khairan. So please afford him your full attention to learn about sleep, but not to sleep here. Jazakumullah khairan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Jazakumullah. Uh, so it's an honor and pleasure to um, sit with all of you today. Uh, when I first came in earlier this afternoon, I said to Mufti Saab the same thing that I'm going to say now. I'm, I'm really here for my own benefit. Uh, one is it's an opportunity to be able to sit in such a blessed place with such a get, blessed gathering. Uh, but number two, I myself, I'm always looking to improve my own health, my own spiritual wellness. And sleep is a really important component of that. Now, I think that <clears throat> I can pretty confidently guess that 
many people would look at this topic and say, what is this guy talking about? Like, <laughs> who gives a lecture on sleep? <laughs> we, we've talked, we hear a lot of topics for lectures, but why would somebody talk about sleep? But I hope that by the end of this uh, session, you can appreciate why I thought this was an important topic to share today. I feel very strongly, as I spoke with um, the students earlier today, that uh, you know, we're facing a lot of challenges as a community. And yeah, we're a community, but we're really one big family. And I feel that some of the challenges that we're facing are due to our lack of um, health and wellness. I I'm not saying that all the challenges are because of that, but certainly some of the spiritual challenges that we face, uh, some of the difficulties that I see within myself, within the community, within our greater family, I think if we understood some basics about wellness and health, uh, sleep being one example, it would really go a long way to help to alleviate some of those things. So my goal here is to one, just highlight the importance of the topic, because I think that's lacking. Uh, and then two, as I mentioned, to, I think there's someone asking something in the back. Okay, sorry. And then two, to provide some really practical tips on, on sleep. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to give a lecture and then everybody just goes away and you don't have one or two things that you can say, hey, I think I can do that, I think I can make that change. So I'm not here to be, be very theoretical and give you all these scientific studies. Rather, my goal is to just highlight the importance of the topic and then to give you 10 practical tips and I hope that each of you will pick a handful of them and perhaps try to implement them in your lives so that you can improve this part of your well-being. Okay, so that, that's the goal. And you can see the title on the screen here, Sleep, the Sunnah, and the Science. Now, uh, when do I have to finish? Okay. Yeah, so let me, let me just start by, you know, you could question me on this title, and I just wanna quickly mention uh, the title, you know, the Sunnah and the Science. I think the Sunnah is obvious to everybody in this room. Uh, we understand the Sunnah to essentially be the enactment of Tawheed in the life and the actions of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions who followed him. And we take that to be a, a firm source of knowledge and guidance. Um, but what about science? You know, what role does science play? Because if, if Sunnah is what we call firm, you know, it's uh, firm, it's absolute, it's something definitive, it's finite, it's definitive, it's something we can rely on, right? If I tell you something's in the Quran, I tell you something is established in the Hadith as, uh, and then particularly has been elucidated as Sunnah by our scholars, then we can hang our hat on that and we can very confidently say, okay, this is something that's acceptable. But what about science? What it, where does science fall into all of that? And so I wanna make very clear that uh, science is part conjecture. Now, you know, it's hard to d digest that for some people, but look, I'm a scientist. This is all I do. I will tell you that when I was 16 years old, <laughs> 15, 15 years old, I started my scientific career uh, sequencing DNA and doing uh, DNA cloning at 15, all right? And I'm 50 now. So I've been doing this for a while. I'm pretty qualified in science, and I think any real scientist would tell you that science is conjecture. Okay, you have to understand that. Uh, the only thing I can confidently say after having practiced medicine for how many years I've been practicing medicine and after having been a scientist and studying science for a long time is that I'm surprised we're even confident about what we're confident about. So we gotta take the science with a grain of salt. And there's a lot of reasons why I don't have time to go into all of that, but there's a difference between accelerating a particle in an accelerator. For example, every atom of, every molecule of water is H2O, right? I mean, we can, that, you can accept that because that's defined. Um, but when we make statements about health concerning people, it's important to always recognize that everyone in this room is different, right? You have a characteristic and a quality about yourself. And so even if I were to study everybody in this room and do a scientific study, it's not studying a bunch of water molecules, which are all H2O. It's studying a bunch of variable individuals who have all these varying circumstances about them. So there are limitations. 
So we have to always take the science with a grain of salt and understand that it's the understanding of today, but it could easily not be the understanding of tomorrow. And, and many things. I mean, you can all understand this if you just look at the history of science. I mean, 1970s, when I was born, um, they sent my mom home with a box of uh, milk cans. And they swore up and down that uh, these milk cans are better than mom's milk. So you must, for your child's brain development, you must give these cans and you must not give mom's milk. Now, that was a scientific understanding of that day, but that scientific understanding eventually got turned on its head and now everybody says mom's milk is best, right? So, again, science with a grain of salt. So I'm going to pick broad principles and recognize that there are some limitations to those principles. We do understand and give an importance to science. I'm not saying science isn't important. I myself am a scientist. It's all I do all day. I teach science. But I'm saying that science has to be put in the appropriate paradigm of where knowledge lies. Quran, Sunnah, science. Okay? So that's why it says the Sunnah and science and not the science and the Sunnah. I was, there's not very many words on my slides, but I was very particular to carefully word them. So the, in, in the introduction part of this, I just want to start by reminding us that all organisms require some form of sleep. Everything sleeps. Fish, insects, you, uh, rabbits, everything sleeps. Even a cell, single cell, sleeps. And any of you who have taken biology, you know that cells go through cycle, and one of the states of the cell cycle is called G0. G0 means resting phase. It means the cell is out of cycle. It's not going through G1, S, G2, M. It's out of the phase of its cycling, and it's resting. So even every single cell, and cell is the functional unit of life. Cell is the brick that makes up all of life. Even every cell rests. So this is the first point that I wanted to make. Now going one step further, this is so foundational to life, so innate, that sleep and rest is actually a distinguishing feature between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of creation. Again, rest and sleep is so foundational and fundamental to life, to the essence of life, that it becomes a distinguishing feature between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of creation. And what's the example of that? We can just go one step for we can just go one step forward here and you just look at this ayah which everybody in the room likely knows Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al qayyum everybody has heard this correct i mean it's a very very famous so allah la ilaha illa hu there is no deity worthy of worship except him al hay he is the living al qayyum he is the everlasting now notice after stating this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hay and he's al-qayyum the next point that's made la ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nom despite being the living and the everlasting neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him okay so even here very quickly after establishing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the living the, the living with a capital T and capital L and the everlasting. Despite being that, as opposed to you and me and every single thing created, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala neither slumber overtakes him nor does sleep overtake him. So it's a key distinguishing feature between Allah and all of creation. In fact, just taking this one step further, sleep is actually a blessing. Sleep is one of the blessings, it's a remarkable gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, earlier in the introduction, uh, Mufti Saab, as he was making the introduction, he uh, read a little descriptor, which is that generally speaking, sleep is viewed as a waste of time. I can tell you, okay, I went to the University of Chicago uh, as an undergrad, and it's a notoriously difficult undergraduate institution to be at, particularly at the time that I went there. Um, it was known, it's still known, but it was really known at that time for the academic rigor and the difficulty of the undergraduate program. And I remember vividly, vividly, 
We used to say to each other, and we used to hear from the teachers, that sleep is for the weak. This was like the common mantra, right? Sleep is for the weak, implying that somehow, not only is sleep a waste of time, but it's an exhibition of a person's fault, that it's like a type of weakness. And I think any, all of you have heard this. Many people will say, you know, we'll sleep in the grave, and sleep is for the weak, and sleep is a waste of time. And my goal today, one of the goals today, is to highlight that actually it's the other way. Sleep is actually a blessing. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of humility. It's not a waste of time. It's a necessary part of being creation. And it is not unproductive. It is actually a highly productive part of our lives. It is actually a highly productive part of our lives so long as it's used appropriately. Just to highlight this further, look at this ayah on the screen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ And from his signs, manamukum is your sleep. When? بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَا And from his signs is your sleep in the night and in the day. SubhanAllah. وَبْتِغَاءُكُمْ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ and also from his signs is your pursuit of his bounty. Now, a, a couple important things to note here. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is called, the Quran is calling, this, it's calling sleep a sign, an ayah, among, men, among the many ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning that it is a, something that when a person looks at it, they should be mesmerized, they should be amazed, and they should, when reflecting on it, be reminded of the magnificence of Allah. Now, we're reminded of the magnificence of Allah twofold. Number one, all of us, despite all of our strength and all of creation, despite all of its magnificence, all require sleep. But la ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nom. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him. So from one perspective, it's an amazing thing. Right? Despite the fact that we in our limited capacities need sleep, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his infinite capacity does not even get overtaken by slumber, subhanAllah. And number two, when we begin to understand the benefits of sleep, it also is eye-awakening and eye-opening to be able to appreciate the intricacy and the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Just like when a person looks at the sun and a person looks at the moon and a person looks at the ground, they're forced to say subhanAllah. They're forced to say, subhanAllah. So sleep is similar to that. That's point number one here. Point number two from this ayah is that it's mentioning our sleep and that our sleep is going to occur in two times. Number one, at night. And number two, during the day. Now notice that this is highlighting, number one, that sleep potentially can occur at two times, night and day. Number, number, number one. And number two, if, that it's beneficial because it's occurring in two times. Meaning if it was a waste of time, it wouldn't be done in two times. Maybe it would be done for the minimal amount of time. Maybe it would be done at one time. And then the next point that we can gain is that immediately after discussing sleep, both during the day and during the night, as a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it also mentions it, the idea of sleep comes in the mind of the listener and then immediately they're drawn to the pursuit of his bounty. Giving us a subtle indication that sleep is relevant to the pursuit of bounty. Now you have to think about this for a second. When you talk about pursuit of bounty, you talk about being awake, right? How, why would it be that from his signs are your sleep and the pursuit of his bounty if they weren't related to one another. Now, of course, they can be opposites. That's one possibility. But the other possibility is that sleep is relevant to the pursuit of bounty, meaning you need sleep to pursue bounty. And after pursuing bounty, you need to sleep. It's a cycle. So as human beings, we actually require this cycle. And what this cycle does is it creates the perfect balance of achievement and rest. So you can't be working 24-7, and you can't be sleeping 24-7. Rather, there's going to be sleep, 
then there's going to be pursuits of bounty. Then there's going to be sleep, then there's going to be pursuits of bounty. And it's the combination of these two things that eventually is going to allow a person to be able to achieve success in this world and the next. And by the way, the pursuit of bounties here, it indicates both our dunyawi pursuits, for example, if you're an engineer, and it also includes our spiritual pursuits. And the spiritual pursuits also require sleep, as we're going to establish in just a few moments. Okay, with that said, I think it's important for all of us to appreciate that, yes, sleep is a break, right? We all see sleep as a break. We all know that when we're sleeping, that's going to be downtime. That's going to be time that we're not going to be necessarily, quote unquote, productive. But it's an essential break. It's an essential break, and in fact, it's been created that way. For example, you all are very familiar with this ayah. And we made your sleep as a subata, uh, like a respite or a break or a rest. So sleep actually has been made as a break. It's meant to be a break. It's meant to be a necessary break. Now, how is sleep a break? Because what happens during sleep is our bodies, our minds, and actually our souls disconnect from the world around us. Normally, look, we're engaged, right? Our bodies are engaged with one another. We're, our, our minds are engaged with the things that we're um, uh, uh, appointed with. Our souls are actually plugged into our bodies, and our souls are busy um, taking the circumstances that the bodies throw at it. All of these things get unplugged when a person sleeps. So this is a, dis a mechanism to disconnect from the world around us, and it creates an opportunity for us to be able to recharge. That sleep that uh, is like a repose or respite, it creates the necessary break to separate what we're doing during the day and then to recharge so we can then reassess ourselves at another time. All right, let me just give you an example. So that's the sunnah in the Quran. Let me give you a little bit of science. <coughs> There's two major types of sleep. One is called REM sleep. Many of you might have heard REM, about REM sleep. What is REM sleep? REM means rapid eye movement. Now, sometimes you'll see when somebody's sleeping, you'll kind of see their eyes going back and forth very rapidly if you observe them. Okay, so that's a special type of sleep. It's called REM sleep. And then the other opposite of that is called NREM or non-REM, which is basically when your eyes are not moving rapidly back and forth. All right? So think about this, that there's kind of two, two types of sleep. Now what happens is, when you first go to bed at night, particularly at night, you enter into non-REM sleep. So initially, when a person goes to bed, it's non-REM. Eventually, after some time, they'll cycle into REM sleep and their eyes will begin to move back and forth very quickly. Now what's happening during these two types of sleep? It's, it's very beautiful. When a person first goes to sleep, and they go into NREM sleep, you know, non-REM sleep, the sleep begins to weed out and begins to remove neural connections and it begins to clean up all the metabolic waste products in the brain. So essentially you can think of it this way. Let me give you a more simple example. You go out into the world. Okay, you engage with the world. You talk to somebody, you shake somebody's hand, you study something, you look at something, you hear something. All of that's coming where? It's coming into the brain. All of this data and all of these inputs are coming into the brain, and you can think of each of them as like a branch or a leaf or a weed. Okay? Now, it's pretty much chaos that's coming into my brain. Like, and any, one, one minute I'm thinking about the groceries, the next minute I'm thinking about what's going on at home, the next minute I'm thinking about what's happening in the masjid, the next minute I'm thinking about what I have to get for dinner. There's all these random thoughts. I'm meeting all these random people. There's all these random interactions. Sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're negative. Sometimes they're sins, sometimes they're good deeds, right? All of this is basically growing like a jungle in my brain. So slowly, 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 as I progress through the day, this like garden of sort of all this randomness is happening in my mind. Now what happens is you go to sleep. When you go to sleep, the first phase of sleep, it's like uh, the landscaper. Think about like the landscaper. The landscaper comes in, they cut the grass, they trim, they pull the weeds, they trim the bushes, right? 
So when we go to sleep, this landscaper begins to work in our brain. It says, okay, what you did there, we need to remove it. All those noises you heard here, we need to remove it. The Quran that you memorized today in the madrasa, we need to keep that. Um, the positive interaction that you had with your spouse, we need to keep that. That fight that you had with your neighbor, we got to get rid of that. Okay? Uh, the car accident that you had, we need to dampen that. So all of this is happening in the brain. And it's like a landscaper. They come in, they pull the weeds, they trim the bushes, they tri you trim the grass. So that's your first phase of sleep. Now after that, about an hour, half later, let's say 90 minutes later, you start going into REM sleep. REM, sleeps ta REM sleep takes whatever's left over and solidifies it. It says, okay, you, you ayat of Quran that you memorized, let me gel you over here. That positive smile that you gave to your spouse, let me gel that over here. That good interaction that you had with that person uh, in your neighborhood, let me gel that over here. So it solidifies the things that are necessary to remain, and then sleep goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until it produces this balance within a person's brain. Okay? So a person sleeps and wakes, and sleeps and wakes, and sleeps and wakes. Now, imagine for a moment, just, play, taking, just building on this paradigm one step further, let's imagine for a minute that a person doesn't sleep appropriately. Okay, and imagine that they're bringing in all the garbage of the world. So this happens, like you think about cell phones today, right? Um, I mean, think about how much trash is on a cell phone. Whether you are productive with a cell phone or not, I'm not making a comment. Whether you should have one or not, I'm not making a comment. But I think we can all agree 80% of what happens on a cell phone is garbage. Not 80, give me 50, okay? A lot of what happens on a cell phone is garbage. A lot of the interactions we have are just a complete, utter waste of time. You watch a dumb video on TikTok, you don't want that permanently embedded in your brain, okay? Now, imagine that a person's bringing, is hyper-inputted, hyper-inputs constantly, pings, uh, videos, texts, um, constantly getting all this input. And then on top of that, they're not sleeping appropriately. Instead of sleeping the right amount of time or at the right part of the day, they're sleeping the wrong amount of time or at the wrong part of the day. So eventually what's going to happen? Are they going to have a garden or are they going to have a jungle? It's going to turn into a jungle. The whole mind becomes like a jungle. And that's, that is exactly what, where we find ourselves today. We got all this hyper input coming in from everywhere. We're relatively unselective about the interactions that we have. And instead of being able to properly weed and trim and cut the bushes, all of this stuff is constantly building. We don't get the proper amount of sleep at the proper amount of time in the proper way. We lose the ability to be able to turn that, uh, to, to trim and maintain ourselves. And all of this begins to build up and it creates a tremendous amount of um, lack of health within uh, anybody who's sort of living that type of lifestyle. So sleep is really important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made sleep as a sign. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made sleep as an ayah, as a blessing. And it has been purposely created to be a respite. It has been purposely been created as a time to pull away from everything, to disconnect from everything, to allow a person to be able to recharge. And if that's missing, it becomes highly problematic. In fact, we can look at this from the other way. And so now, let's talk about what happens if a person doesn't sleep properly. So what are the known effects of not sleeping properly? Number one, okay, we'll go through a series. By, by the way, these are all scientifically validated, okay? These are big, established, good studies. I'm not just quoting just anything to try to prove my point. These are established studies. So number one, lack of sleep is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. What is cardiovascular? Heart and your blood vessels. For example, stroke and heart disease and all of the things that can happen with the, with the blood vessels in the heart. So cardiovascular disease, increased risk. Number one. Number two, increased risk of infection. If people don't sleep properly, it's been shown that their immune system doesn't function properly, and definitely they have an increased risk to viruses, for example, colds. Next, accidents related to drowsy driving. It's very interesting. Accidents related to drowsy driving. Now, what are drows drowsy driving? A person falls asleep behind the wheel or just falls asleep for a moment or is not fully capable because they're sleepy. 
accidents related to drowsy, to drowsy driving are greater than the accidents related to alcohol and drugs combined. More accidents happen because of drowsy driving than happen because of alcohol and drugs combined. Next, lack of sleep leads to extremes of emotion. Listen very carefully. Lack of sleep leads to extremes of emotion. If you take a healthy person and you reduce their sleep and then you study the brain activity, the brain activity found in the healthy person with reduced sleep is the same brain activity that's found in people with psychiatric disorders. Okay, did you understand that? If you take a healthy person, you reduce their sleep, you study their brain activity, you take a patient with a psychiatric illness, you study their brain activity, the brain activity looks similar. And I think this is very simple to understand because I already established the paradigm. If somebody is not sleeping properly, they're building up all of this jungle in their mind, right, inside of their head. Now, it's a, neur it's a neuritic jungle. It's not a physical jungle. It's an, the neurons and the way everything's connected. But the connections, the whole wiring gets messed up. Now you can see that there's going to be an increased risk for sadness, depression, suicide, uh, anxiety, all of these things. You know, one of the treatments for all of these different disorders that I just mentioned, depression, anxiety, uh, suicidal ideation, etc., one of the key things that the psychiatrist discusses with the patient is sleep. So it's very important for a person to understand the deficiencies that arise with sleep. The next one, individuals who sleep less than six hours per night have a much higher risk for diabetes and weight gain, much higher risk for diabetes and weight gain, and a 40% increased risk of developing cancer. 40% increased risk of developing cancer and what was the study? 25,000 people. Wasn't, they didn't study 10, 15, 100, 200, 2,000 people. 25,000 people. In fact, if you look at the WHO, they print a list of carcinogens. For example, the most common carcinogen that everybody in the room is aware of is cigarette smoke. Cigarette smoke and cancer are like hand in hand. So those are called carcinogens, things that are known to cause cancer. So if you look at the list of carcinogens released by the WHO, one carcinogen is working the night shift. People who work the night shift have a clearly increased risk of cancer. Now, what's the purpose of all this? To scare you? No. The purpose of all of this is to just remind myself and all of us here today that sleep is essential. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created sleep as a mechanism to reset. And if we're not going to treat sleep that way because we're busy uh, binging on some show, or we're busy thinking that we're, we're bigger than sleep. You know, we exhibit this arrogance to think, I don't need to sleep. You know, I'm above sleep. Then it can be particularly harmful spiritually and physically. So with that background, what I've done is I've reviewed all of the studies and kind of done my little analysis. And I, and I, I had a very complicated talk. I've given this talk before, but historically, I've had a very complicated talk, and I keep trying to make it simple. And I just said, you know, let me just take... 10 simple sleep tips. Let's just fo focus on 10 things that we can all do, which are very practical and will provide us with key information that will help us to be able to thrive in this life and the next. So 10 simple tips from the Quran and the Sunnah, which are also established by science, by the way, which will help us, inshallah, be able to maximize on this blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for us. So tip, sleep tip number one. Sleep tip number one. Each one is one slide. They're very simple. Sleep tip number one is to sleep according to need. Now, um, a very common question that people ask me is, okay, fine, I understand everything you said, but how much should I sleep? How much should I sleep? And the answer is that a person should sleep as much as they need to feel refreshed and to avoid fatigue. Your body should tell you how much you need to sleep. Now, that number varies, by the way, because there's genetic differences in everybody in this room, and everybody in this room has different amounts of exposure to different, different, different types of stimuli. So there's no one number fits all. I know 
that they like to say, you should have this many hours of sleep, but those are blanket statements. They're not necessary, they're just general guidelines. Every person is, in, is going to be their own individual to determine how much sleep is necessary. But I can tell you, as a general principle, your body should, you should listen to your body. We should listen to our body when it comes to how much sleep we need. So we should sleep as much as needed to feel refreshed and to avoid fatigue. But, but, so it's not infinite, but we should never sleep through mandatory acts of our deen. And we should never sleep through essential responsibilities such as work and family. I think this light is going to sleep. <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. Um, anyway, so you get the point, right? Which is that sleep as much as the body needs to sleep, but that's not an excuse to sleep through prayer. Prayer should never be slept through. And it's not an excuse to sleep through family responsibilities. Like the whole family's up and ex uh, energetic and excited and they're all having dinner together and you're on the couch sleeping. All right? So that's also not acceptable. So it needs to be balanced. And we have to titrate the amount of sleep that we have and the places that we uh, embed our sleep in order to ensure that the needs of our body are fulfilled. Now, where am I getting this principle from? I'm getting this principle just straight from the sunnah. Notice the statement on the screen the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned. <coughs> if one of you feels drowsy while praying, he should go to bed till his slumber departs. All right? So, now, I mean, this isn't that you're in the middle of Fajr and you just uh, halfway through, <laughs> you get up and you say, okay, now I gotta go sleep. No. What it means is that you're doing some sort of extra ibadah or you're at a time in your life where you're just engaged in, in prayer but you start feeling drowsy. So that's an indication. It's a message from your body that you need to sleep. So this is principle number one, that uh, you should sleep as much as necessary but should not sleep through essential responsibilities such as salah, such as um, family obligations, such as work. And your body should dictate when you need to sleep, and it's predicated on, on this example. And another example is also present here. The Prophet them he mentioned, offer prayer and also sleep at night, as your body has a right over you. So here we're learning a balance. There's benefit to praying at night. We should take advantage of that benefit to praying at night. But at the same time, we're not going to be Superman. We're not going to flex our muscles and think that we don't need sleep at all. It needs to be balanced with sleep. All right, number two, number two, sleep early and rise early. Okay, now let me, before I even go here, I want to just highlight a general principle. <clears throat> acts in our deen, so our deen teaches us beneficial acts. Can we start there? Our deen teaches us beneficial acts. But subhanAllah, beyond teaching us what's beneficial, it also teaches us the best time and place by which we can maximize that benefit. So you understand, these are two separate things. Number one, our deen teaches us beneficial acts. But number two, our deen also teaches us the time and place by which we can maximize those beneficial acts. For example, two, two rakah of supererogatory salah is beneficial. But if you take that two, two, same two rakah of supererogatory salah and you stay in the masjid after the fajr prayer, and you wait until the sun sufficiently rises, you can get, this, you can get the reward of a hajj and an umrah. Right? You, you all are aware of this opportunity of ishraq prayer. If you take those same two rakah and you pray them in Makkah Mukarramah, you receive such a great reward. If you take those same two rakah of supererogatory prayer in Medina Munawwara, you get another different type of reward. So the deen teaches us the benefit of the supererogatory acts, <coughs> but also teaches us the best way, the best time and place in which to embed those acts. And by the way, that's barakah. That's how you take a simple thing and you leverage it to gain multiple layers of benefit. So in the same way, sleep also has its appropriate time and place, which also creates barakah. Okay? So this is an important thing to appreciate because we want that when we sleep, we get the maximum benefit physically and spiritually from the sleep. And the deen teaches us those things. For example, one general principle about sleep is that there's not much barakah in sleep <coughs> after the fajr prayer. Once the fajr prayer occurs, it's generally a good habit to stay awake. There's a lot of barakah in doing work at that time. Put it this way. 
There's a lot of barakah in doing work at that time. Another important principle. There's a lot of barakah in sleeping after the Isha prayer. Now, I violated my own <laughs> principle here. <laughs> but anyway, just for a second. There's a lot of barakah in sleeping after the Isha prayer. Now, particularly, I should just make a caveat here. Historically, the Isha prayer would be prayed a little bit later in the night at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So, you know, not exactly when Isha comes in, but with a little bit of a delay, generally speaking, it's a good habit to go to bed. There's a lot of barakah in sleep after the Isha prayer. Isha prayer is a time when you wind down. The day should be starting to wind down. It's not a time to pick up a device and go into another universe. It's a time to begin to wind down, to focus on... Uh, your prayer and yourself by praying the Isha prayer, particularly in the masjid, and then to go home and to focus on the family by engaging with the family and engaging with the spouse. That's the habit of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay? So, generally speaking, these two principles. Number one, sleeping early because there's a lot of barakah in sleeping after Isha. And number two, rising early because there's a lot of barakah in working after Fajr, in pursuing our pursuits after Fajr. For example, here's a narration in which we're told that the Prophet ﷺ would not sleep before evening prayer and he would not stay up after it. Okay, look at the two principles being established. He would not sleep before evening prayer. By the way, Maghrib to Isha, not a good time to sleep. There's a lot of barakah in doing things. A lot of barakah in doing things from Maghrib to Isha. But it's not a time of sleep. So the Prophet ﷺ would not sleep before evening prayer. Here, here the evening prayer is reference to Isha. And he would not stay up after it, meaning he would pray the Isha prayer and he would begin to wind down. It's not a time to, hey, let's go grab a, you know, uh, something with our friends. It's a time to wind down. It's not a time to start a new project. It's a time to begin to bring things in. It's not a time to go off on a new adventure. So it's a, there's a lot of barakah in sleeping shortly after the Isha prayer. Roughly, roughly. You know, I, I understand there's variations in the way we, we pray it today and the timing, particularly in whether you do it earlier or later, but there's a lot of barakah in sleeping at that time. Here's another uh, uh, famous uh, statement. The Prophet Sallallahu said, O oh Allah, bless my nation in their early mornings. O oh Allah, bless my nation in their early morning. Now what is this telling us? This, telling us? this is telling us that there's barakah in the early morning. It's a time, by the way, this blessing refers to working in the early morning. For example, two examples re relevant to this particular narration. Example number one is that the Prophet Sallallahu used to send expeditions at the beginning of the day. Now, you know, the Prophet ﷺ would send expeditions for various purposes. So his habit was to send, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was to send expeditions at the beginning of the day. And there was barakah in doing so. So when we wake up in the morning, it's a good time to hit our tasks. To hit the tasks that are most important to us. Not to pick up the phone, but to think about what's important to me. For example, maybe... I'm a young child in a, or I'm a student in a madrasa. Lot of barakah in studying early in the morning. Maybe I'm trying to memorize Quran. Lot of barakah in trying to memorize Quran early in the morning. And I'm going to hit on these principles a little bit later as well. Now, one step further. Aside from sending, um, aside from sending the caravan, uh, sorry, aside from sending the um, the uh, expeditions early in the morning, it's also mentioned that uh, one of the companions, based on this, would, set, would actually do his trading early in the morning, would send his caravans early in the morning. And based on sending his caravans early in the morning, he became a very successful and wealthy trader. So again, highlighting one very simple principle, which is that if there's something that's important to you, something that you're trying to achieve, some goal that you have, very beneficial to approach that early in the morning. Tip number three. Tip number three, make wudu before sleep and sleep on your right side. Tip number three, make wudu before sleep and sleep on your right side. Now, just to highlight this, let's just look at this particular uh, narration. The Prophet ﷺ advised a companion, <coughs> when you go to bed, perform wudu like you would for prayer. When you go to bed, perform wudu like you would for prayer and then lie on your right side. Now, just think about this for a minute. When a person sleeps, does it maintain or break their wudu? 
It breaks will do. So isn't that counterintuitive? Like you're making will do to do something that's going to break will do. But the point here is that there is baraka in doing so. There's baraka in the wudu. Now, the baraka particularly is that if you take this narration one step further, now notice I put three dots here. If you take this narration one step further and then after this advice, the Prophet ﷺ listed a dua that if a person does these three things, you know, they go to bed, they perform wudu, they lie on their right side and they make this dua, then they can be assured that they'll die with faith. So, you know, that's a separate blessing, which is a spiritual blessing, which I've, I've mentioned to you. But I just want to mention also spiritually, just think about this. When you go to bed, you're processing everything, correct? Your body's sort of resetting. It's capturing the good, and it's hopefully uh, removing all the waste products, metabolic, spiritual, and physical, okay? When a person makes wudu, what happens? When a person makes wudu, their sins are being wiped away. They're refreshing themselves. They're rejuvenating themselves spiritually. So you can think of it almost as, almost as like taking out the first layer of trash before the mind and the body is going to function to remove the next layer. So you're taking out the big garbage before the mind begins to detail all of the smaller garbage. So it, there's a lot of baraka in making wudu, number one, because of the spiritual benefits. You're bringing cleanliness into sleep, and that brings baraka into the sleep, which then allows a person to be able to take maximum benefit. Okay, sleeping on the right side. I mean, obviously, there's a preference for right. Um, <coughs> there's preference for right in our deen. And not only that, but I can tell you scientifically, interestingly, uh, the right side has been shown to benefit the cardiovascular system, meaning when a person sleeps on their right side, there's less strain on the heart, which is on the left. So it benefits the cardiovascular system. And number two, it's shown that a person who sleeps on their right side will have an increase of the fluid that runs over the brain, meaning there's an increased flow. The fluid stays the same, but the flow of the fluid increases, leading to greater clearance of metabolic waste products. So when a person's sleeping on their right side, there's less strain on the heart, less strain on the blood vessels, and more clearance of the metabolic waste products in the brain. So subhanAllah, even physically, there's a lot of benefits to sleeping on the right side. Now, of course, the ultimate reason to do all of this is the sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ advised and taught this, and of course the benefits are going to be myriad of benefits in this world and in the hereafter. But anyway, it's a general principle, so we should recognize it and make an effort towards it. Now just taking this one step further, at the same time, as an aside, we should remember that the Prophet ﷺ specifically um, recommended against sleeping on the stomach. So we should avoid sleeping on the stomach. In fact, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu in one narration mentions that Allah dislikes this position. So it's something that we should avoid. We should not purposely try to sleep on the stomach thinking that it's a better way to get rest. In fact, interestingly, just as another aside, medically, um, one of the things that we teach uh, parents, <clears throat> as soon as a baby's born, we're, we're, we remind uh, mom and dad, uh, the newborn, mom and dad of the newborn, that they should not put the baby to sleep in their crib on, the, on their stomach because there's an increased risk of something called sudden infant death syndrome, where ch children will die or for some, at this point, unknown reason. So um, even as early as infancy, it's been shown that sleeping in the stomach is not beneficial. It's something that it should be avoided. So again, you know, just to highlight this one step further. Point number four, tip number four. Tip number four, sleep in a dark, cool, and quiet environment. Sleep in a dark, cool, and quiet environment. Now, interestingly, uh, this example comes from the Quran. You know that there was a famous incident in which there were these group of youth who were seeking to save themselves from the fitna of their time. And they sought refuge in a cave. So they were, went to this cave, and they sought refuge in this cave, to protect their iman, essentially. And they slept for how long? Hundreds of years, right? They slept for hundreds of years. Now, it's interesting, I find it interesting personally, that they slept in a cave, which tends to be cool, dark, and quiet, right? So I'm not saying that that necessarily establishes that you have to sleep in a cave. But what I'm trying to say here is that I find it interesting that if you're going to sleep for 300 years, it's, it happens to be in a cave, OK? So 
what, how can we take a lesson from that? Like, how can we gain some understanding from that? What we can understand from this is that we're not going to literally sleep in a cave, but the sleep environment should be cave-like. The sleep environment should be cave-like, meaning it's better for it to be dark, it's better for it to be relatively cool, and it's better for it to be quiet. <coughs> and honestly, if you look at the studies, multiple studies from sleep scientists, they all establish the same three things. They say that the best sleep, the highest quality sleep, occurs in an environment that's cool, dark, and quiet. All right, so what are some important features of how we make an environment cool, dark, and quiet? The number one point I'd like to make here, I could make a lot of points, I could talk for one hour just on this point, but I wanna make one. In order to maintain the cool, dark, and quiet environment, I would highly recommend that everybody not bring their cell phone into their bedroom. In order to maintain a cool, dark, and quiet environment, I would highly recommend that everyone in this room never keep their cell phone next to them while they sleep. You might think, well, wait a minute, I don't get disturbed, what are you talking about? What if I turn it off? What if I turn the notifications off? Studies show, number one, that anybody who sleep, the people who sleep with their cell phone next to them do not go into deep sleep because their part of their mind is focused on the phone. And studies show that even if you turn the phone off, the same effect remains. The same effect as if the phone is on, as if the phone is ringing. So, uh, the phone, by its nature, is highly distractive. It's highly disruptive. It's very anti-focus. If we let that stay in our bedrooms at night, half our mind is sleeping, the other half is awake. Uh, I mean, I'm figuratively saying this. I can't tell you that it's exactly half of your brain. But a part of your brain never fully goes into shutdown mode. Because you're thinking that an input is coming in. Imagine if you knew that there was a, you were sleeping in a cave and you knew there was a tiger, right? You're not going to fully sleep because you're partially awake, okay? So now you're in your bedroom, which is supposed to be a cave, but this phone is there, and this phone is like a spiritual tiger. It's just constantly gnawing at you. So general principle, number one, our children should not sleep with their phone in their rooms. Now all the parents, they turn to their children. Now children, you turn to your parents. Parents should never sleep with their phone in their room. Nobody, nobody, nobody's immune. Nobody, nobody should sleep uh, with a phone in their room. And, you know, subhanAllah, it used to be, in the good old pious days, that the last thing somebody would do was make dua to Allah when they, woke, when they went to bed. And the first thing they would do when they woke up in the morning was make dua to Allah, that they awoke in the morning. And now the last thing that they do is they look at their idol, and the first thing they do is they turn to their idol. What is going on here? Like, you know, it's a time to wind down. It's a time to take advantage of a blessing of Allah. It's a time to focus on Allah. It's a time to make dua. It's a time to recognize I'm about to die. You know, there's a t it's, a, it's a mini death. It's a, it's a sister of death, okay? I'm about to uh, exit, quote unquote, this world. You know, my body and soul are going to be separated temporally for, for some time. <coughs> That's what happens, by the way. It's a time to be focused on Allah. It's not a time to worry about notifications. It's not a time to worry about uh, what's going on in this, this chat and that chat. So a, a very important take-home point that I would uh, pass on to everybody here is make your sleeping environment like a cave. And the most important thing is to just keep the cell phone away. Now, you know, children will argue with you, but, but, but dad, mom, I need to wake up. This is my alarm clock. Or you may argue with me. What are you talking about? This is my alarm clock. Go buy an alarm clock. You know, don't give me that. B buy a night. I wasn't born yesterday. <laughs> I wish I was, but I wasn't. Uh, go buy an alarm clock, okay? And keep an alarm clock. But by the way, honestly, if you follow all of these pieces of advice, <coughs> you won't even need an alarm clock. Because actually the most beautiful sleep arises when you wake up naturally. Uh, you shouldn't even have to set an alarm clock. Your body should wake you up. And by the way, the body is all programmed to do that, you know? Uh, there's spikes of uh, cortisol that occur and that tell your body to wake up. And there's downing of cortisol that occurs at night that tells your body to go to sleep. 
Now, we mess it up because also the other reason why this all gets messed up, by the way, uh, again, I'm going on a tangent, and it'll come up later, so we'll save some time there. But you know, there's a clock in your brain. I don't know if you appreciate that, but there's a f actually fully functional clock in your brain that's perfectly set. It's called the circadian rhythm. The body has its own internal clock. And what drives that internal clock is light and dark. Light and dark, okay? So ideally what should happen is that uh, think, you know, during the day you bring in light, and then your body sets its clock, and then when the sun sets, you bring in darkness, and the body begins to set its clock, and then based on the light and dark cycles, you then shift into, um, your, 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 your clock begins to program how the rest of your day should be. It wakes you up at the right time, it puts you to bed at the right time. It makes you feel sleepy at certain times, it makes you feel more awake at certain times. Now what messes up the circadian clock? What messes up your clock, the one that's designed for you, your personal clock? One of the things that messes it up is the light that comes from a cell phone. It's called blue light. And what happens is when you look at a cell phone, it's shining all this light into the eye. Now the eye is processing that as heavy light, as like active light. That light goes to the brain and resets the clock and turns it off, you know, turns it awry. So it's really important to recognize that, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later, but about two hours before you go to bed, you gotta start putting things away. It's not a time to turn on all the lights in the house. It's not a time to uh, be sitting on a device. It's not a time to be sitting in front of any screen for that matter. It's not a time to be sitting in front of any screen for that matter, okay? So please be careful about maintaining a, the, a positive sleep environment. Because by the way, there's two issues in sleep. There's sleep length and there's sleep quality. Now, I know many people in this room will tell me, man, I slept 12 hours last night and I could sleep 12 more, right? Have you ever felt that way? I slept 12 hours last night, <coughs> and I can sleep 12 more. And that's not because um, the sleep wasn't, uh, the, you know, that you need 12 more hours of sleep. It's because you got 12 garbage hours of sleep. It was not deep sleep. It was not good sleep. It was not properly in tune with the rest of the body. And now we feel all groggy, and then on top of that, we, we throw Starbucks. It messes up the whole system. It messes up the whole system. The body naturally w wakes up at the right time, and the body naturally goes to bed at the right time. And subhanAllah, I'm telling you, this programming is actually in line with what we already talked about. The body's designed to shut you down after Isha, and the body's designed to pop you up before Fajr. If you look at the actual rhythm, the natural rhythm, that's exactly the natural rhythm. And by the way, there's also a little rhythm that wakes you up in the middle of the night, also. I don't want to go into this study, but if you take people and just disconnect them from everything and throw them in a cave for days and days and days on end, they naturally will begin to wake up twice. They'll wake up once in the middle of the night, feel energetic, feel sleepy again, and wake up once again before sunrise. So it's really I find it really interesting because it's very concordant with the way our deen uh, teaches us. Okay, just as a further highlight of this, aside from the people of the cave, or the, the companions of the cave, um, the Prophet I said, I mentioned, put out the lamps when you go to bed, shut the doors and cover the water and food containers. Now, of course, put out the lamps here is an indication, can be an indication that uh, at that, you know, you've got candles and you've got other types of flammable things and so these are dangerous, they should be covered, they should be put out, the food and water should be put away, etc. But as a general principle, I, what I'm trying to highlight here is you shut down, right? You're shutting down the lamps. You're shutting down the doors. You're shutting down the food and the water, which also I find very interesting, by the way, right? You're shutting down everything, and you're beginning to transition into this beneficial time of sleep. All right, number five, halfway there. Number five. Number five, take afternoon naps when possible. Number five, take afternoon naps when possible. Now, remember that I told you that you have a clock inside of you called your circadian rhythm? So one of the natural dips of alertness, physiologically, one of the natural dips of alertness actually occurs in mid-afternoon. It's funny because I still remember from medical school, I mean, this was a while ago when I was in medical school, they would show us a chart, a graph of when accidents occur. So the two times when accidents are most likely to occur, one is shortly after like Isha time, and the second is midday after lunch. Now part of that is because people eat heavy meals, and I was sharing this earlier today with someone, whenever you eat a meal, two-thirds of your blood flow goes to your stomach. 
okay? So it's a lot of blood and energy going to your stomach every time we eat. So of course, it's gonna drain some blood from the rest of the body and it could make you sleepy, but generally speaking, there, there's a physiology driving people to take a nap in the afternoon. Just to f highlight this further, first of all, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions used to regularly nap in the afternoon, okay? The Prophet ﷺ and his companions used to regularly nap in the afternoon. Additionally, I'll just share one very interesting study with you. There was a really big study, a wonderful study done by Harvard School of Public Health. Harvard School of Public Health. What they did was they tracked 23,000 Greek adults. 23,000 is a big number, it's a good study. And they tracked them across a six year period. And during that six year period, some of them stopped uh, taking naps and others took naps. Now, by the way, in Greece and in certain countries in Italy, there's a, uh, sorry, in certain countries of Europe, there's a good habit of taking naps in the afternoon, okay? But they tracked the population, 23,000 adults, and they followed a subset of them stopped taking naps because life became too busy. And another subset of them maintained their naps despite life becoming busy. And what did they find? They found that at the end of six years, the ones that had stopped their naps, they had a 37% increased risk, risk of death. 37% increased risk of death compared to those who napped. And in working men, the increase of death, risk of death was 60%. And places where people maintain the nap, they were much more likely to reach the age of 90 versus American males. So nap increased um, health and increased the, uh, the, the possibility of reaching the age of 90. Now, what are we trying to highlight here? Now, why is that important to us? I mean, look, we're all passing from this world. But the reality of our time here is that we're trying to maximize on the opportunity. If I can be around to do as many good deeds as possible as 90, at 90 and be healthy, it's something that I desire because I can maximize my return in the hereafter. Number one. Number two, if I can be around to at least try to oversee my grandchildren and maybe to be able to oversee my great-grandchildren, that's also a benefit for the community. Right? It's a benefit for the community because we need people of wisdom, we need people of knowledge, we need people of understanding to be watching over our families, and we certainly, certainly need our scholars to be healthy and to be around as long as possible. So taking a nap in the afternoon is a very good thing. Now, the next thing you're gonna say is how long? How long? And the answer is that it should be about 20 minutes. Roughly 20 minutes. So I can tell you that, you know, personally, I try very hard to take a nap in the afternoon. I try very hard to take a nap in the afternoon. And usually what I do for the afternoon is I'll set uh, a timer, uh, I have a, like a little timer that's by my bed, I'll set it for 60 minutes with the understanding that I'm gonna wake up much before that. Sometimes 45, depending on the time. And usually I'm up before that. But anyway, the point is, you don't wanna go into an hour and a half because if you get past an hour, you enter into like a deep sleep that will mess up everything for the rest of the night. So you gotta be careful, it's short. It's meant to be about, let's say 20 minutes roughly. All right, so, so that's uh, tip number five. By the way, just as a highlight of the power of naps, look at this um, uh, part of the Quran here. إِذْ يُغَشِّيكُمُ النُّعَاسِ when, when he made drowsiness overcome you. أَمَرَةً minhu As a security from him. Now what's this in reference to? When uh, Sahaba were uh, in, uh, awaiting uh, the Battle of Badr, when Sahaba were awaiting the Battle of Badr, one of the interesting things that happened was that they fell asleep. Now, not a deep sleep, just like a drowsiness. And subhanAllah, that drowsiness is mentioned in the Quran. And that drowsiness, what it really does, now what's the benefit? What's the benefit? Number one is, I mean, it's happening here because it's a barakah. And of course, there's innumerable benefits. But one benefit to, to taking a nap is it creates new energy in the person when they wake up. It's like a quick recharge, a quick recharge. Now, I'll tell you, personally, I can tell you, the most productive time of my life, most pro I, I've done many things. I have medical school, residency, fellowship, professor, uh, madrasa, most productive time of my life was when I was in madrasa. I, I don't remember any more productive time. And why was it the most productive? Because what would happen was, you know, it was such a natural schedule. First of all, I didn't have any garbage to distract me because I was very focused on what I was doing. 
You know, I just had my studies and my family, and I was in a foreign country. I didn't interact with too many people. There were no devices at that time. It was, I mean, there were devices, but they weren't like so promiscuous as they are today. Um, but essentially what would happen, I would just naturally wake up early in the morning, all right? I would be able to do a few things at that time. I would stay awake all the way through class. Uh, we would have lunch, and then Vuhr would be at 1.30. I would just lie down at 1 o'clock. 1.20, they would call the Adhan, a little before 1.20. And I would just pop up. And as soon as I popped up, I would have like a brand new day ahead of me. So I literally felt like I was accomplishing two days worth of work every one day. And I did that over like a couple years. So I feel like, you know, I accomplished all of this stuff that I would never have been able to do at any other time. And I still find that to be true today. Wake up early, use all the energy you can to get yourself to, the, to roughly like the Dhuhr mark. Ideally pray Dhuhr, <clears throat> perhaps depending on the season, maybe you wait till you, you pray Dhuhr after. Take a short nap, wake up, and then start fresh, and it's like a brand new day. And I can also tell you that if you happen to be somebody that's trying to memorize a lot, for example, these young kids that are memorizing Quran, the benefits are innumerable. Because what happens is you memorize, 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 you achieve a certain amount, and then you fatigue. And then if you sleep, it solidifies what you learned, and it resets the mind to take in another layer. So it's a very, very productive way to memorize things or to learn new material. Even if you're studying, it resets the brain in a very powerful way. By the way, as an interesting point, uh, you know that famous uh, track star, fastest guy in the world, what's his name? Huh? Bolt, Bolt, yeah. Bolt, you know what he used to do? Uh, he broke many world records, correct? But uh, do you know what he used to do before he broke the world records? He would take a nap. He would take a nap right before the race. Now you think, nap before the race, that's the time to be like freaking out. No, he would take a nap before the race, he would wake up, and then he would go run the race and he would break world records. So there's a lot of energy that arises in a person uh, after a nap. Okay, uh, now we're going downhill. Things will move faster. Uh, point number six, memorize Quran or Dua before sleeping. Memorize some Quran or Dua before sleeping. Okay. First of all, our, our deen places a premium on Qur'an, memorizing Qur'an, engaging with Qur'an, regularly reciting Qur'an. It's valuable to try to inculcate as much of the Qur'an into our memories as possible. And one of the important features about sleep is that it strengthens memory and improves retention, especially after learning. Okay, T to understand this, you gotta go back a little bit. You have to know that when you learn something, you have to divide it into days. For example, let's say you're a physics student or a high school student, any high school student. The first time you learn something is called day one. Then there's day two, then there's day three, then the, eventually you come to retention. So learning something and forgetting something is very easy to do. I'm not saying it's the easiest thing, but it can happen. You can quickly cram a bunch of material in your mind and you can learn it. But retaining it is very hard. So how do you retain? The, way that, the best way to retain is to s learn something sleep on it, learn it the next day, sleep on it, learn it the next day, sleep on it, and it becomes one with you. So sleep is really important in retaining your learning. So one of the reminders I would give to uh, all of the students here who are trying to memorize or all of the students who are memorizing Quran, which by the way, we all should be memorizers of Quran. I'm not saying you have to memorize the whole Quran, but every day you should try to memorize even just a half a line. I don't, I mean, I don't want to go into a talk about this topic right now, but if you honestly, if you just memorized a line every day, by the end of your life, you would be shocked at how much Quran you would know. Because the, the best things come when they're small and consistent. The best results in anything come when it's small and consistent. Now, what, what I'm trying to say here is if you are a student who's memorizing Quran, I don't know if any of the HIF students are here, or you're one of the students that's trying to memorize your, your, your lessons, a very powerful time to memorize is right before going to bed. So the time to do the new sabak, the time to do the new lesson, let's say you're gonna go to bed at eight o'clock or nine o'clock, okay? Nine o'clock for, for kids, let's say nine o'clock. So from eight to nine, you should hit that lesson really hard. From eight to nine, this thing is showing me an error. Uh, eight to nine, you should hit that lesson really hard. And then sleep on it. 
Don't bring anything else into the mind. That's not the time to be like reading fairy tales. Sleep on it. And when you wake up, when you revise it, it'll just come to you like that. I mean, many, many studies have shown this. When they, give these, they put these people in a room and they'll challenge them, you memorize these 40 things, you memorize these 40 things. And they'll let these, 40, these people memorize the 40 things and go to bed. And they let these people memorize the 40 things and then they put them on, on TV, okay? And these people are confused. The ones who are watching TV, it's a big mess. They can't remember what happened. These people who memorized 40 things and went straight to bed, they wake up, they quickly revise, they know the 40 things. So there's a lot of power in, uh, in, um, in memorizing right before you go to bed. And if you're memorizing Quran, that's a really powerful time to learn something new. Sleep will organize all these memories when we gain rest. Uh, sleep deprived, by the way, another feature for students and for memorizers of Quran. If you're sleep deprived, it's not happening. Sleep deprived individuals have a 40% decreased ability to cram facts. Sleep deprived individuals have a 40% decreased versus those who sleep properly. So definitely non-negotiable for any HIF student to stay up too late. Because you need your sleep. If you're not fresh when you go to Madrasa, you're just going to be adding to all of the frustration. Now, I know I'm not a HIF student, but I see on their faces, they get frustrated. And part of that frustration sometimes is because we as parents don't support a proper sleep habit. So a couple things we can do as parents. This isn't the responsibility of the mother son. The kids are home by that time. It's the responsibility of us and, parent, and the parents. As parents, we should encourage our kids to memorize, and we should work personally with our kids to memorize maybe half an hour before they, uh, before, right before they go to bed. <laughs> and we should make sure that the kids have good sleeping habits. We shouldn't be putting them on a screen all night and then sending them to madrasa the next day. What's the teacher supposed to do? Now you sent a kid who's, you know, half with it, and the teacher is supposed to, poor teacher is supposed to try to get this kid to their goal. It's not going to happen. So we should maximize the ability of our kids to achieve success when they uh, in, get involved in any endeavor. Okay, this one I know you're not going to like. <laughs> That's why I put, I put a little assistance in parentheses. <laughs> Uh, avoid caffeine. Avoid caffeine. Caffeine is a drug. I know you don't want to hear that word, but caffeine is straight up drug. Okay? It is a drug. It is totally disruptive to the sleep-wake cycle. And it shouldn't be that the only way I can wake up in the morning is I need a hit. And the only way I can keep myself up after lunch is I need another hit. And if I take one before I sleep, I can't sleep. It's a drug, it disrupts the sleep-wake cycle, it messes up our nervous system, it, and impairs our ability to be constructive throughout the day. So, again, if you can't decrease it, if you can't avoid it, reduce it. Now, you'll tell me, I mean, I remember in Mother Sub, by the way, I don't drink any caffeine. I just, I don't drink any caffeine. And I remember in Mother Sub, when I was in Mother Sub, they said like, is this guy human? What's wrong with this, you know, he's Ajib. This guy's Ajib, and they used to say all the time, because they would be the real tea. Uh, they would boil it, boil it, boil it all day, and then drink it. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I, just can, I can just tell you, you know, it's, it, it, it's a drug. It makes you less effective. It makes you more sleepy, and makes you dependent, among many other things. So generally speaking, it's good to avoid or at least reduce uh, caffeine. So this is something that I would recommend. By the way, just to prove my point, here is a picture of a spider web made by spiders on four different drugs. Okay? All right, look at, look at uh, the normal. So this is a spider web uh, with no chemical, normal spider. By the way, spider is a good example, right? Because spider is also... Anyway. Now look at the spider on marijuana. Look at the web and how the spider makes the web if you put them on marijuana. It's pretty decent. It's not so bad, right? But it's wrong, okay? It's not right. Now look at the, the next drug. And look at caffeine. Look at the mess. It's a nervous mess. The, the spider is just can't, out of control, can't organize itself, can't figure out what's right and what's wrong. So, uh, you know, it does disrupt the nervous system. It does disrupt the sleep-wake cycle. Uh, we, I know we view it as essential. We think of it as the way to wake up in the morning and the way to go to bed at night. But the reality is, is that it's something that, sh that should be avoided. Okay, by the way, one very important thing. Uh, children should not be touching caffeine. 
children should not be touching caffeine. Uh, if you take a bunch of uh, uh, rats and you expose them to caffeine, uh, three things happen. Number one, remember the sleep I told you? The first part of sleep that cleans up everything in the brain? That, um, that sleep goes lower. So the sleep, the good sleep that cleans up everything, it d reduces. So that's the first problem with caffeine. In, in, in young rats, okay? Not adult rats, young rats. Number two, uh, it delays brain maturation. So it's been shown in juvenile rats that their brains don't mature properly if they have caffeine. And number three, it, de it uh, delays a, a development of social activity. So we certainly want, don't want to expose our children. Children are very, uh, are developing. They're still growing, they're still forming, right? So we don't want to expose them to caffeine. No Coke, no tea, no Mountain Dew, none of that stuff. Uh, no caffeine for kids. Okay, we should be particular about this. All right, next. Uh, don't disrupt your circadian clock. Uh, I already talked about this, so we can pretty much skip this. Simple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created within each of us an internal clock. And this inter internal clock is predicated upon the sun rising and setting. And it's the rising and setting and exposure to light that allows us to be able to maintain this physiology. By the way, I find it amazing that um, even the Quran, when it talks about uh, the people of the cave, it mentions, and I'm not going to go into the details for the sake of time, but it mentions that if you were to see the sun, you would see that when it rises, it veers away from the cave in a certain way. And then when it sets, it veers away from the cave in a different way. And they're lying in the middle of the cave. So it's interesting that the rising and setting of the sun is discussed vis-a-vis -vis the people of the cave. I'm not saying it's talking about circadian rhythm, but I'm just saying that it's interesting to see that the rising and the setting of the sun is relevant even to the people in the cave. So the rising and setting of the sun is what sets our clock we should be particular about maintaining that clock. Number nine, make dua before sleeping and after waking. Make dua before sleeping and after waking. Now look, sleep and wake is a major transition in a human being's life. Major transition, because look what's happening. When a person goes to sleep, they're finishing the writing of one page of their book of deeds, correct? It's the end of the day. And when they wake up, they're awakening to a new opportunity. So they're finishing yesterday and waking up and, and, and looking forward to tomorrow. So we should close the day uh, turning to Allah and we should begin the new day turning to Allah. And all of us know, right? First of all, sleep is a tremendous blessing. It's one of the many signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We benefit so much from the sleep. And on top of that, we benefit when we bring the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into anything. So we should bring Allah's name into sleep so that we increase our gratitude towards Him, we increase our focus on Him, and we appropriately cap the day, and we appropriately begin the next day. And of course, these are already embedded you know, in our, in our sunnah. So we know, for example, the, the dua that should happen before sleep, Allahumma bismika amutu wa ahya. O Allah, in your name, O Allah, in your name, I die and I live. Now, I die and I live because death is sort of like, uh, sleep is a sister of death. When a person goes to sleep, it's, uh, it's, like a, it's like mimicking death. By the way, that's really important. Why? Because we're going to die one day, right? And sleep is the dress rehearsal of death. Listen very carefully. Sleep is the dress rehearsal of death. When a person goes to sleep, they should be toning everything down, reflecting on what they did, making wudu to purify themselves of their sins, and reflecting on how they spent the day so that they can seek forgiveness for any mistakes and return back to their Lord. It's a reset. It's an opportunity to think about my life before I actually do die. And just like sleep is a mimic or a dress rehearsal for death, it also opens the opportunity to the next day. So if we open the opportunity to the next day, we should wake up and we should begin our day with Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. All praise is due to Allah. He who woke us up. 
like he who brought us to life, after undergoing this dress rehearsal of death. And this was a dress rehearsal because ilayhin nushur, to him is the return. So this dua encapsulates the reality of what happens when we wake up. There's a tremendous complex physiologic interaction, spiritual interaction, physical interaction that's happening at the time of waking up. And yes, and tomorrow is a new opportunity. You know, think about this. One of the beautiful opportunities of sleep is that I get a new shot at life every day. Right? I don't have to carry yesterday's mistakes into tomorrow. That's the beauty of our deen. Each day is a new opportunity. Each day is a new shot. Each day is a clean slate. So we should be aware of this opportunity and be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for creating it for us. And we should take advantage of it. So we should see sleep in that way. And by the way, by looking at it that way, it's going to create health. Because I can tell you that one of the big problems when it comes to wellness and maintaining our health and being energetic is we tend to bring yesterday's problems into tomorrow. We don't need to do that. If I made a major mistake, the beauty of, of my deen is that I can seek forgiveness from Allah and I can go to bed and erase it and start over. That's one of the beautiful aspects of our deen. So we shouldn't bury ourselves in yesterday. We should liberate ourselves towards tomorrow. It's a major mistake people make. People live yesterday and they, brag, they bring yesterday to tomorrow. For example, you know, uh, some, some, bad things ha some bad thing happened on Wednesday, okay? So now on Thursday, I'm complaining, oh my God, I can't believe that happened to me yesterday. Now, what did I do? I just brought all of yesterday into today. Instead, I should have deleted it. And maybe if I wasn't able to de delete it in one day, I could delete it in two or I could delete it in three. But the more we try to bring yesterday into tomorrow, the more, yes, the, the more tomorrow becomes like yesterday. You understand that subtle, subtle uh, you know, piece of wisdom there? So each day is a new opportunity. We wake up, we praise Allah. All glory be to Allah. Alladhi, he who brought me back to life, brought us back to life after causing us to die. Meaning, gave us a new opportunity after whatever happened yesterday. And to him is the ultimate return, which always should be in the back of our minds. Okay, so this is the dua, it's on the screen here. And the last, we should ease in and we should ease out. So very quickly, we should ease into sleep. Now, what, am I, what do I wanna say here? Sleep is not like you slam on the brake. Okay, you're running, 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 busy, 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 doing all these things, and then, boom, it comes time for sleep, and now you think you're just going to go to bed and you're going to be asleep. No, you have to ease into sleep. Ease into sleep means you begin to wind down. For example, no cell phones for two hours before sleep. No screens, no screens for two hours before sleep. Okay, you can't do that at least one hour before sleep. Begin to wind down. You ease into it by praying Isha in the masjid. When a person comes to the masjid, they pray Isha. It, it's kind of the end of their day, right? They, the, it separates the day from the night. So you come, to, you know, you wind everything down. You come to the masjid, you pray Isha. You get home, you begin to wind things down. You're putting the food away. You're putting the closing the doors, etc. Like we talked about earlier, and. Um, by the way, another very good piece of advice is to not eat, you know, in the two hours before you're going to sleep. So that your body's digested, right? It's, it can, you don't want that you eat this big meal, okay, you eat this huge meal, and then you go to bed. Because how much of your blood goes to your stomach when you eat? Okay, somebody's paying attention. <laughs> Two-thirds. I already said that once before. So now, look, imagine you go to bed, you want all the energy to happen in your brain, right? To clean the body, reset the body. And instead, all this energy is focused on digesting all the food that a person ate. So it's better to not eat one, two hours before a person goes to bed. And then, after easing into sleep, you should ease out of sleep. 
Now, what do I mean by easing out of sleep? So the first thing after a person sleeps, look, the beauty of sleep is it cut off the dunya, right? It disconnected the dunya. It disconnected me from the chaos. It disconnected me from the uh, text messages, from all of the busyness. So right when I wake up, I don't want to jump into it. I want to take advantage of the fact that things are slow to do things that are important to me. For example, don't grab the phone right when you wake up. Because what's going to happen? The first thing, you're going to get distracted by 10 emails or 10 text messages or 10 chats. Don't worry about the phone. The first thing when we wake up, make dua to Allah. Alhamdulillah, okay? And then the second thing is make wudu. And the third thing is to pray. Ideally, fajr in the masjid. Now, by the way, what are those three things going to do? Uh, uh, number one, make dua. Number two, make wudu. Number three, pray. Anybody know what those three things do? Sorry? Okay, baraka, fine. But anybody know specifically what they do? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We know from, we know from the sunnah that when a person goes to bed, shaitan ties three knots. When a person goes to bed, shaitan ties three knots and says, keep sleeping, keep sleeping, the night is long. Now I'm paraphrasing, but roughly, stay asleep, stay asleep, the night is long. When a person wakes up, if they do three things, they'll be fresh. It freshens them. It unties those knots. Those three knots that were tied get untied by three things. Number one, dua, remembering Allah. Number two, making wudu. Number three, prayer. These three things um, free, they liberate, they liberate a person. They create energy, they create excitement, they create passion for the day because I started out on the right foot. By the way, there's a famous book. It, it's not such an interesting book, but it's famous about a, a military individual who writes about how he's achieved his success and he, his whole argument I find this interesting. His whole argument is the first, the reason why uh, the, the, they're successful in the military is because they start out by making their beds every morning. They're really strict about making their beds. And he argues in this book that the reason that that's beneficial is because um, they do something successful. They succeed in something. So when they achieve a success, they're encouraged to achieve the next success. Now, subhanAllah, our deen already teaches us this. If we do these three things, you turn to Allah, you can be happy. Alhamdulillah, I woke up, and the first thing I did, I turned to Allah, I feel good. Then I make wudu, I feel refreshed, I feel energetic, I purified myself. I, and then you go and pray, that creates an energy in a person, a success, which becomes like a snowball. Now you go to work, you're excited, you're energetic, you're successful. One, spiritually, because you've untied the knots, Two, because physically you've achieved something already. You've already. You can already check your box off. I did these three great things, so I got only better things to look forward to for the rest of the day. So really important to ease out of sleep. Don't jump on the phone and then start jumping on email and then start jumping on, you know, doing all these things that are distractions. And then we feel groggy the whole day. Now I'm drinking one coffee here, one coffee there. I don't have any energy. I don't have any focus. No, the solution to that is very simple. It's very simple. Number one, turn to Allah. Number two, make wudu. Number three, pray, fajr prayer. Ideally in the masjid, but at least at home. Okay? So these are three very simple ways by which we can ease out of sleep. So sleep is a blessing. You don't want to crash into it. You don't want to crash out of it. You want to slowly approach it to take it, because by the way, every blessing, you should learn this principle, every blessing uh, extends itself in its directions, right? For example, uh, the, the benefits of Ramadan begin even before Ramadan. Some of the benefits of Ramadan arise even before Ramadan, and some of the benefits of Ramadan arise even after Ramadan. I don't want to go into this detail, but it's a general thing to think about. So sleep is a blessing. Some of the benefits of sleep actually occur before sleep. 
And some of the benefits of sleep occur after sleep. So we should leverage this opportunity to take the maximum benefit possible by easing into sleep and easing out of sleep. All right, so these were 10 very simple principles. That's it, that's all I have to say. Um, the purpose of me talking about this topic is because I feel that um, many of us are getting worn away at our edges. I'm just being straight honest. Many of us are worn away at our edges. We're feeling frustrated. We're, uh, we feel a lack of energy. We feel a degree of sadness. We feel a degree of uh, lack of productivity. We may not be focusing as well as we normally used to focus. And that's because there's a lot of stress that's gone on in the world around us. And also, there's a lot of changes with cell phones and constant inputs and all of these things. But I, I feel that one of the important features by which we can preserve ourselves is to make sure that we think about our sleep. Now, it's not only sleep. It's food. It's personal relationships. It's diet. It's exercise. But sleep is an easy one. Sleep is an easy one. So the power of sleep, we should never forget it, and we should always leverage it. And we should approach it with humility, recognizing that it's a way by which we show that we're dependent on Allah. It's not a waste of time. It's a way that I show that I'm actually a creation, and I'm dependent on my Lord. And a few simple tips, you know, that I just provided. Maybe you can't do all of them. Okay, maybe you can't do all of them. And I'm not saying it's easy to do all. Maybe you can pick one or two and try to uh, inculcate these and see how it affects the way you feel, the productivity, the way you're able to achieve things. It's so important to maintain the blessings that Allah has given us. Uh, I want to make this one last point. Our health and wellness has already been given to us. We don't have to go find it. You don't need to go Barnes and Nobles and read some books on health and wellness and where do you find health and wellness. You already have it. This is a a blessing that Allah has given each of us. He has created us in the be with the best of forms and in the best of states. Our responsibility is to maintain the blessing that Allah has given us. There's a difference, right? You don't need to find it. For example, let's say that you're a, a person who has uh, 10, $10 billion. Okay? Your investment advice is very different than the person who has no money. Because the person who has no money has to first earn money. But the person who has 10 billion just needs to maintain it, right? There's a difference. So I'm telling you that you're already billionaires. Allah gave you the greatest blessings of health, wellness, uh, the basic things that are needed to function as a human being. Our responsibility is to maintain it by fulfilling some basic mandates of our deen. And these simple principles from the Quran, the Sunnah, and which are further backed up by science in many cases, these will help us to maintain ourselves and help us to be as productive as possible and help our children to achieve their goals. We need our children to be, you know, superstars because they're going to carry the community on their shoulder. And they need to be superstars in deen and they need to be superstars in dunya as well because that's how this community is going to thrive. And the way by which we can achieve that is by ensuring that all of us maintain these blessings that Allah has provided with us, provided for us. It'll allow us to be, bring happiness into our homes and it allow all of our members, inshallah, to be able to achieve success in everything that they do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who are able to take advantage of his infinite blessings. May he make us amongst those who are able to inculcate the sunnahs of sleep. May he make, it, make, may he make our sleep a true rest for all of us. May he make it a means uh, for us to be able to be reminded constantly of the reality of death that is approaching. And may he make us amongst those who are able to achieve success and happiness for ourselves and our families in this life and the next. وآخر تعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين I'd like to take this opportunity to, uh, on behalf of the whole community, to say Jazakum Allah Khaira to Dr. Sheikh Hussain Sattar for giving us this amazing opportunity to benefit from him. And on behalf of the seminary students, I'd like to also uh, extend an appreciation, a vote of thanks to him uh, for spending, mashallah, from after Jama'ah, he's been spending time with us. May Allah reward him and, and grant him uh, barakah in everything he's doing. May Allah protect his family. And whatever effort he's doing in the community, may Allah allow his children and his family to benefit even further and more. Amin Abil Alameen. Tomorrow morning, Fajr is 6 a.m. We'll have the Team Fajr program. And as we said, we have the, this week's uh, Tazkiyah talk will be given by Sheikh Imam Omar Suleiman. 
Remember the hadith, whoever performs Salatul Isha in Jama'ah, you get the reward of standing up half of the night. Whoever performs Salatul Fajr with Jama'ah, you'll get the reward of standing up the entire night. So please be here for Fajr with your family and friends. We'll have breakfast as well, inshallah. All the seminary students, kindly, inshallah, you can take a stretch. And then your uh, snacks and talent show and attendance will be downstairs. So the seminary students, inshallah, you can greet Sheikh Hussain and uh, visit each other. But in a few minutes, please proceed downstairs. Attendance will, will be taken downstairs. Zakmullah khairah. 17, 18, 18, under. Oh, okay. Good, how are you? Good to see you, Prashant. Thank you, Zagala. How are you? How is your family now? So, how are you? So, how are you? How are you? I'm doing well. Very nice to see you here. It's only good for you. Yeah, yeah, let me just finish things along with each other. How are you? Good. So sleep is for the weekend. I am weak. So.